I don't have a quiz for you today. I planned on doing one, and it completely slipped my mind. That's what happens when you get old. Uh, so we're starting Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. We'll probably finish it on Friday. If we don't finish it on Friday, we'll finish it pretty quickly on um, Monday. So start the next book for Monday, which should be... Garth Nix is several. Um, how many of you have read this one at least before? Almost all of you. And if you haven't read it, how many of you have seen the films? Okay, so you've either read it or seen the film. If you've seen the film for this one, you've got about 75% of the book because they did not change much. They just skipped a lot. Uh, the film's kind of the greatest hits of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Okay? First, how many of you know how she began this? Or how she came up with the idea? It's like on a napkin in the coffee shop? Close. Wasn't she on a train and had a dream? She was on a train. She didn't have a dream. It just came into her head. Just popped into her mind. She's on a train from Manchester... England to London. That train, train from Manchester to London, England, pulls in at what's called St. Pancras Station. Okay. St. Pancras Station is literally directly across the street from King's Cross. Two major rail stations separated by that wall to that wall. Okay. Because one serves one area of England, and the other, St. Pancras, serves another area of England. There's another one about a quarter mile away called Euston Station. It serves an entirely different area of England. Okay? King's Cross serves the northeast, the east, and the southeast. St. Pancras serves the Midlands area. Uh, Euston Station is the train you take to go, um, for example, up to Edinburgh okay? and other places. So she's on a train from Manchester to London. She is, this is around 1991. She is um, not married, and she's either just had a baby or she's still pregnant. I can't remember which. Uh, she had been married, got divorced, okay? Uh, she's living on welfare, Scottish welfare, Scottish assistance and such. She's living in um, Edinburgh. And I don't remember what she's going down to London for, but she's going down to London for something. And so she, at one moment, you know, is um, poor unwed mother. And the next moment, she's still a poor unwed mother, but she's a poor unwed mother with an idea. That is, she's sitting there, and suddenly... This idea pops into her mind of a boy who discovers on his 11th birthday that his parents were killed by the most powerful dark wizard who ever lived, and that dark wizard wanted to kill him. And so she starts jotting down. Now, she'd always been a writer from her early kid years. Bad writer, but, you know, she'd written. Right? So she starts jotting this down, and she... Goes back from London, back up to Edinburgh, and she takes a legal pad with her to a couple of different cafes. She is, her, her daughter is born, because she starts writing out kind of the basic outline of this first tale while rocking her daughter's pram with her leg and writing this all out on legal pad. Okay? And she realizes pretty quickly, this isn't just one story. This is going to be seven books. She knows that almost from the outset for a couple of reasons. One, the idea just keeps growing. Okay. Two, she has said in multiple interviews, because of C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, which is seven books, which at that time she regarded one of her favorite series of literature. So she was going to have seven books to kind of 
parallel the seven chronicles of Narnia and such. Well, she doesn't just write the first book, beginning in 1991. She starts writing the first novel, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. We'll call it by its real title, not its stupid Americanized title, which we'll talk about in a moment. And while she's writing this one, she starts drafting outlines for each of the other six books and taking notes, pulling newspaper clippings, so that by the time she publishes Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone in 1997, she has six other boxes, like legal-sized file boxes of notes for each of those books. Now, there's a lot of stuff that did not make it into those books. Right? But she's taking names, place names. For example, if you walk around Edinburgh, you will see names that find their way into the Harry Potter canon. Dursley, for example, is a street name. But it's a name that refers to a person in Scottish, you know, cultural history and such. All right? So, she publishes the first book in 97. Now, I'm pretty sure, I could be wrong about this, I'd have to look at this and prove it. <clears throat> This doesn't have her birth date. Um, I'm pretty sure when she begins writing this, when she has the first idea, her mother is still alive. But her mother dies between here and here. Dies of cancer, breast cancer, I think, at about the age of 45. So she's pretty young. J.K. Rowling's only in her early 20s. All right. So her mother never sees her as a quote-unquote success. Between here, okay, she's still poor, relatively. She's still on assistance, public welfare, okay. She has gotten a humanities, a Scottish Humanities Council grant to help writing. She sent off a couple chapters. They said, eh, they gave her, I think it was something like 3,500 pounds to um, help her subsist a little bit. But she sends it off. She gets it published. We'll talk about publication in, in a moment. And But she's essentially still poor here. She's still unmarried. Not that women have to be married. I'm just because, you know, we're going to talk about her previous marriage in a moment. But between here and here, notice, 10 years. From here to here, 16 years. Okay? She goes from being poor to what in 2007? Billionaire. Billionaire. One of the richest women in the world, the richest woman in the United Kingdom, wealthier than the queen. Now, that's a lot of dough. Right? In fact, she's a billionaire before 2007. I think she's a billionaire in 2005. I think that's when the, you know, the additional digit ticks over, okay? She publishes this in 97. Depending on what source you look at, she got anywhere from, because I've read about three different things that have said, uh, three different sources that have read, that have given three different numbers for rejection letters. Anywhere from 12 to 20 rejection letters. That is, she sent the typescript off to a publisher. Publisher said, nope, no good. Rejection. She gets 12 minimum. 12 of those. I don't know about you, but I'm not good with rejection. One time, okay, 12 times? Really? I'd probably give up writing. But she doesn't. She finally sends it off to an acquisitions editor for Bloomsbury, the Bloomsbury Group. And this person essentially says, yeah, we'll take a shot. Okay? Bloomsbury prints a very small print run of the very first printing of the very first edition of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. And I used to have this written down. This is the book I normally teach from. It's like 1,500 or 3,500 copies. I mean, it is a really small 
print run. They're thinking we're not going to make any money on this. So we're not going to lose a lot of money on this either. Okay. Well, parents see it in the bookstore, not with this idiotic American cover. Uh, I don't have a first edition of the British one, but with a different cover. And, you know, it gets bought. Kid reads it. Kid falls in love with it. Kid loans it to his best friend or her best friend. That person reads it, falls in love with it, gives it back to kid A. Kid A then gives it to somebody else. Kid C then reads it, gives it back to kid A, gives it to another kid. Meanwhile, kids B and C are asking for their parents to buy it for them. Right? It is spreading solely by word of mouth. There is no advertising for this first book. There's almost none for this book, but those 1,500 or 3,500 copies, they sell out relatively quickly. So Bloomsbury issues a second printing, and then a third printing, and then a fourth printing, because they keep selling. But they're still not advertising, right? Second book comes out in 98, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Same kind of thing. Almost no advertising. All right. Third book comes out spring of 99. This is when I hear about it. I'm on my way to work one morning. This is back when I used to listen to NPR. Um, and the London bureau chief of NPR is talking about this new series of books. The guy named, guy's name is T.R. Reed. And he's you know praising these books. Kids are just eating them up. And he says, you know, they're kind of like C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, but they're not stodgy and dull and, and, you know, preachy about Christianity. And I just kind of mentally turned him off at that point. Because right? I love C.S. Lewis. I teach a course in the Inklings, et cetera, et cetera. Well, later on, about a month later, I'm at Sam's Club buying groceries for the family. And there is these two books... This one has not yet hit the, actually this one has just come out, which is why the other two are still there. And there's the three books sitting on the, the big book bins that they used to have then. And I see the first one, hardback, pick it up, and I read the first paragraph. And the first paragraph just, you know, sucks me in. Because it's that line... Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four per a driver proud to say they're perfectly normal. Thank you very much. It's the thank you very much. That quintessentially British line that, you know, just kind of grabs my attention. And I stand there and I read the first chapter. Just standing there. Throw it in the cart. I don't buy the second and third ones. I throw it in the cart. I read it over like the next day or two. I go back and I buy the next two because I'm, I'm hooked. Okay? You start to hear some advertising with this one. It's in the scholastic book club things that are, you know, given to school kids. Okay? These two aren't. They are published by Scholastic in the United States, but they're not in those book club flyers yet. You get the major advertising with book four, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. It's this one that you see, it's the reason I have the asterisk above it. It's this one that you have the first midnight release party. Why? 2000. Amazon is only about six years old. It is still pretty small. It's not, it doesn't own the world like it currently does. Right? Not many people are using it. Barnes & Noble online, still pretty small. But... The book becomes the New York Times bestseller list before anybody even has a copy in their hand. It has sold so many copies before anybody can even look at it that it's to the top of the New York Times bestseller list of books. Which is completely ludicrous, right? How can it be at the top when nobody's actually read the book? We're seeing the book, <clears throat> other than a picture of the cover. Okay? So, people get same-day delivery. That's when it begins. That's when Amazon starts. Their same-day delivery service. Okay? So, you order the book. 
And you can get it the day it comes out, or you can stay up till midnight and go dress up as a you know goofball and you know, go to the party, <laughs> etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. This thing sells millions of copies the first day. Nothing like this has ever happened in history of publishing before. Okay. But then you got to wait three years for the next book. You haven't had to wait. If you started with this one in 97, you could get your you know Harry Potter fix every year. Now you go through withdrawal for three years. Well, what happens between 2000 and 2003? September 11th. Right? So there's a change. There, there is a kind of a change in the tone between book four and book five, just as there's a change in tone between these three and this one. Okay? And then it gets darker and darker and darker. This one, when it is published, there are, I don't remember what it is, something like six or seven million advanced copies sold. That is before release date. And in this one, there's more. And then this one, there, each one breaks new records. Okay? I think it is with this one, when book five, Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, is published, you now have on the New York Times bestseller list of books, one, two, three, four, five. They're the top five books. So, and it might, might be with this one. In either 2000 or 2003, the New York Times, in its infinite wisdom, says children's books should not be at the top of the bestseller list. Why? Because the bestseller list is meant for serious fiction. And Harry Potter is not serious fiction. So they create a new bestseller list. Children's fiction. And when this one comes out, the top seven books are all Harry Potter. It still pisses them off. I mean, still today and still then. Why? They, the New York Times has no respect for these as quote-unquote literature. It's not literature. It's, you know, what does Snape say in the one book? Foolish waving of wands. It's you know that kind of thing. All right. Well, what part of the reason I think for that is you go back to here and you have people dressing up like witches and wizards, going to the pre-release parties. Okay. You start having conferences where supposedly adults start dressing up like witches and wizards or like Harry, Ron, Hermione. Weird. Okay. And speaking in conferences about, you know, all kinds of stuff. I've never gone to any of these because yeah, it's too weird. I did go to the release party for which one of these? One of these two. I think it was this one. In 2007, I was teaching my Harry Potter course in London. One of the students got me tickets to the, the um, I can't remember what the podcast was named. It was a podcast going on at the time related to Harry Potter. And there was a big podcast release party at the, water, the big Waterstones in London right down on Piccadilly. Right? And they were going to have people dressed up you know, as Hagrid, etc., come and, and talk. So they had this big party from like 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock. You had to have tickets to it to get in. And then at 9 o'clock, they kick everybody out. Why? Because the line has started forming earlier in the day outside Waterstones for people to get in at midnight. That line, when we get there, around 7 o'clock or so, that line is about a mile long. Okay. By the time we leave, a little after 9, it's about 2 miles long. Okay, This is for this book. How many of you have read this book? Most, many of you have. How many of you have seen the film if you haven't read the book? Okay, the rest of you, so I'm going to give it away. And there are people dressed up for this release like Lupin and Tonks, 
Because the notebook six, they get married, and they're thinking what? Yay, they get married. They're going to live wonderful, happy lives. And no, sucks to be them. You know? And a variety of other people. Fred George, you know, Creature, uh, Dobby. Blow those, you know, <laughs> out of the air. Okay? Um, so, I mean, that's kind of the history. Now, let's go back to this one for a moment. Because our title, American title, is Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Why? Why change it from Philosopher's Stone to Sorcerer's Stone? Well, because the American publisher, Arthur A. Levine, publisher and editor, in meeting with J.K. Rowling and going over the book with her because he made changes to it, okay, said to her, American parents are never going to buy a book for their children with the word philosopher in the title. We, we don't do philosophy. Here in America. He essentially said Americans are too stupid to buy a book with the word philosopher in the title for their children. Why don't we change it to sorcerer? And she kind of went, yeah, sure, okay, whatever. Why? She's just interested in selling the book. Making a few bucks at this point. She's not interested necessarily in quote-unquote artistic integrity. And I would say, based upon some of her decisions, even after all this, you know, Harry Potter and the Damned Child, Cursed Child, uh, really shows the idea of artistic integrity went out the window a long time ago as she just started raking in the bucks. All right? What's the problem with, well, what's the problem with this title as opposed to this title? Okay. Talk about this one for a moment. Does anybody know what the Philosopher's Stone is? Well, if you've read the book, you do, right? What is it? It's a stone. Very good. <laughs> What's it do? Okay. You can use that stone to produce the elixir of life that allows you to live forever, as long as you keep drinking it. You can also use that stone to take base metal and turn it into gold. Okay. Does she create it? I don't mean within the course of the novel. Does she create this idea, no. How old is it? Thousands of years. It's not just back to the Middle Ages. It goes back to ancient Egypt, ancient China, like 1,000 B.C. Okay. Really old. So this is an idea in cultural history that is important, that people have been searching for it, thinking it's a reality that if you could create this thing, you could get these two side effects. Now, the reason for creating it, however, is not for riches and immortality. That is, that's kind of the Modern, and by modern, I mean the last 500, 600 years. That's kind of the modern idea of what it did. That it was solely for kind of personal gain. It wasn't. The alchemical tradition that it kind of comes out of, and that we see going back to ancient Egypt and even ancient China, the alchemical tr tradition was all about one thing, ultimately. Transformation, or another way of understanding it, purification. Transforming this stuff, physical body, into a purer form that would not die. That would be immortal. To go from mortal to immortal. That would be the riches, because what you then gain is 
Trinity, right? That's why many of the alchemical, quote-unquote, scientists, especially in the Middle Ages and later, they were thoroughly within the Christian tradition. Because what does Christianity talk about? Well, immortality. Purifying. God is a purifying fire. What does that mean? It burns off all of the rot, the dross, etc. Okay? So, all of that is bound up in this term. This is not Plato's stone. This is not Wittgenstein's stone. This is not, you know, Marx's stone, all philosophers. It's not a stone of philosophers. It's the philosopher's stone, right? So what's this? Louder? Dumb. It's nothing. This has never existed in the history of ideas. It's never existed as a thought in any culture until about 1998, when the American publisher bought the rights to the book and said, you know, I think we ought to change the title. And she said, okay. Well, what else did this do? What's the difference between sorcery and philosophy? One, you're just sitting around thinking big ideas, and the other one, practicing magic. And what happened in the United States, primarily, when the book started to get a lot of press. Some of you might come from families that said this. Some of you might have gone to schools that said this. This is what? This is of the devil. This is demonic. I mean, the Old Testament law, the first five books of Moses, essentially all ultimately say what? You burn witches and wizards. You have nothing to do with them. Anybody who practices witchcraft, you stone, you kill. You know. Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Therefore, that school is demonic, it is satanic, and anybody who reads these books is putting their soul in danger of hell. So... You had, even though, you know, I've mentioned before, I'm an Orthodox Christian, go to church, started a church, and I teach these all the time. So, you had an awful lot of, let me ask you to characterize them. What kind of Christians saying these books should be banned, these books should be burned, these books should not be allowed in grade schools, junior high schools, and high schools? Puritan would be a nice kind of benign way of describing them. Okay, I'll use my terminology. Right wing, out of the woodwork, whack jobs. Crazy loons. Sorry if that describes your family. I, I once had a graduate student. Her husband was a minister. She was like, she had five kids. Dr. Sherman, I can't believe you teach that stuff. I can't believe you even read that stuff. What do you want your children to? And I can't remember her name. I'll make one up. It was something like Abigail. And I was like, Abby? Why, why do you say that? Well, they're all about witchcraft. Have you read them? No. Well, there's your problem. Read the damn thing before you want to burn it. And I went on, on my Fahrenheit 451, you know, a lot of different ways to burn a book. Okay? Censoring. Banning. It's one thing if a parent wants to tell his or her children, I don't want you to read that thing. It's another thing entirely for a parent to tell another parent your child can't read it. So that's when that parent's rights violate are violated by another parent's rights. That's when I, as a parent, kind of say, get off my yard. <laughs> get out of my life. Get out of my purview of raising my children. So if it had, had the original title, I don't think there would have been nearly the problem with it. Because it doesn't talk about sorcery in the, does it talk about quote unquote sorcery in the book? Yeah, but it doesn't use that word very often. It uses magic. And it's not magic like you'll read every now and then today. That kind. 
with decay on the end, with, uh, which often indicates something like modern paganism or Wicca or something else along those lines? Does she do anything in the books anywhere that indicate any of this? No, she doesn't. Does she say, Hail Satan, no. our chief infernal leader? No, she doesn't. She doesn't say, save me Jesus, either, anywhere. Though she does have, beginning, I think it's actually here. She has Hagrid say something like, thank God, and it's G-A-W-D. But later on in the books, when all hell is breaking loose, she has an awful lot of thank God. And it's clear in that context that it's used. It's not just a proverbial, oh, thank God. It's thank you, God, kind of a thing, when various Weasley's lives are saved and that kind of thing, right? So the book opens how? Well, I read the opening paragraph. It starts at the beginning, right? This is not a book that begins what's called in Medius Race, in the beginning of things. If we are reading the Lord of the Rings, the Lord of the Rings begins in the middle. There's a whole lot that's gone on before Bilbo's birthday party. Bilbo and Frodo's birthday party at the beginning of the Lord of the Rings. You've got The Hobbit, that went on before. You have all the stuff with the Silmarillion, that went on thousands of years. So Tolkien just kind of, you know, he's, he's holding us and we're suspended in air and he goes and drops us down in the middle. J.K. Rowling doesn't. As much. We don't begin with Harry's birthday, right? We begin where? Voldemort has been defeated. Voldemort's been defeated. And it takes her seven books to explain how, essentially, he was defeated when Harry was a baby and everything else that happens up to his final defeat, okay? So, as I said, or as I've said, we're going to skip a lot here, okay? So Harry gets dumped on his aunt and uncle's doorstep. Describe his life from age one, about one and, what is it, one and a quarter, okay? Because he's dropped on his parents, excuse me, on his... Um, Aunt and Uncle's doorstep on eleven one. I don't know what his birthday is. Eighty. No, eighty one. Either eighty one or eighty two. I don't know. It's in here somewhere. Because my parents die in eighty one, so it's the next seven. Eleven one eighty one. That's from eleven November first. Okay. His parents died when? Day before. Halloween. Okay. So from this point, because he's born January 31st, uh, excuse me, July 31st, 1980. Why? Why is he born on July 31st? She just picked that date out of the air? No, it's her birthday. It's J.K. Rowling's birthday. Not 1980, however. She didn't start writing these when she was 11 years old. She's not that good. She's good, but she's not that good. Um, describe his life from then to hut on the rock in the sea. Shitty. So sad. Shitty, terrible, so sad. So shitty, terrible, sad. You know, could have kind of in a sense. Why? His family is horrible to him. He embodies everything that they want to shut away. Why? Because he's a, he's a wizard. He's because they're perfectly abnormal. normal. Because they are Thank you very much. perfectly <laughs> normal. And they don't hold, we're told, in that same paragraph to what? Anything strange or mysterious okay how do we see that within the course of that opening chapter what happens on Dudley's birthday they're on the way to the zoo 
Harry's with them. They don't want Harry to be with them. He talks about how he saw like a flying motorcycle in his dream and Vernon turned around and screamed at him. He dreamed about a flying motorcycle and Vernon, you know, busts the gut. Motorcycles don't fly. Harry's like, I know, it was a dream. <clears throat> dreams aren't real, right? Everybody knows dreams aren't real, right? Harry knows dreams aren't real. He's just kind of blurting it out that this happened. So why does Vernon go so berserk? He knows something. Okay. Hagrid had a flying. That's how Harry got there. Did Vernon? See the flying motor? We're never told that. Okay. It might be that the letter that Dumbledore leaves says something about that. Okay. So he wants to do what? He wants to kill this. Why? Okay, so if you don't hope with anything strange or mysterious, then how do you live your life? Or what characterizes your experience of reality? What kind of books do you read? Kind of mag boring ones. Give me an example. Forbes. Louder? Forbes magazine. Forbes magazine. Okay. Louder? The newspaper. The newspaper. Okay. That's all facts, right? Well, used to be. There aren't any papers that don't report the facts anymore. How many of you had, if you took, you know, one of the writing courses, 1010 or 1020, how many of you had to use a a um composition manual of sorts, like the Harbury's Handbook or something like that. Not a page turner. Not a page turner. It's like reading a grammar textbook. Just kill me now. That's, that's the Dursleys. So if they don't hold with any strange or mysterious and they're perfectly normal, they define normal, right? So how do they define normal? Us. If you're not like us, then you are what? Strange. Strange. Mel Brooks' Young Frankenstein. Abby normal. Okay? Odd. Different. And they don't... So that when Vernon sees people in robes, in cloaks on the street corner... Weirdos, oddballs. Yet what happens when they start seeing owls flying around during the day? What does, from somebody like the Dursley's perspective, what does that mean? How do you deal with that? Put that in our world context, okay? Our world. What if, you know, I open these blinds and you suddenly see 50 or 100 owls fly by right now. What would that tell you? Yeah, something weird is happening. There's not supposed to be owls out during the day. So if something weird is happening and you don't allow for the possibility of the weird, you either completely do what? Block it off so it's as if you don't see it. Okay. Or you make mental excuses for it. Why? Because it doesn't fit your reality. It doesn't fit your reality, your understanding of reality, then what must you do? You have to force it to fit your version of reality, which might mean denying it entirely. Okay? Hagrid arrives. No, notice how they try to deny reality. What happens before Harry's birthday, which starts to happen? He starts receiving letters. Notice, they don't come beginning on Harry's birthday. They start before. He gets one owl, right? He goes, I, I, I got a letter. I mean, not an owl, it's in the post. I, I, I got a letter. Dudley yanks it out of his hand. Harry says, give it back. Vernon, and he's like, Petunia, burns it. Next day, he gets what? Two letters. Day after that, they start coming in various ways. Owls come down chimneys. 
One day, the letters arrive how? In a carton of eggs. It's not that they are stuffed underneath the eggs. Where are they? They're in each egg. Think about this for a moment. How the hell do you get a letter inside a chicken's egg? Do you give it to the chicken and say, eat the letter, chicken, and then, no. So what should that tell Vernon and Petunia? Strange, mysterious, and they can't control it. So what does he do? He hammers up the door. He hammers up the windows. And they still find a way. So they leave. They go off to the hotel, and about a hundred letters arrive there. Drives off, buys a shotgun, goes off into the woods, comes back out, goes off, hires the little boat, the little dinghy. They get out to the hut on the rock in the sea, and midnight comes, and the door gets blasted down. And who comes in? About as strange and mysterious a person as you can imagine, because describe Hagrid. Giant. How giant? Like eight Twice the height of a man and at least five times as wide. Twice the height of a man and at least five times as wide. So, 12 feet. We're told his hands are the size of dustbin lids. That's like 50 gallon trash can, round lid. You know, if I had a trash can here, it'd be like one, two, three, maybe four of my hands spread like this. Would be maybe three. Yeah, probably about three. Hagrid's single hand. Finger, wrist, thumb, little, big sucker hands. Okay. Big old overcoat. Carries everything in it. They're not in Kansas anymore, right? Okay. And what gets revealed? When Hagrid says, I'm here, here's your letter, Harry. And Harry says, uh, excuse me, I'm, 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 I'm what? You're a wizard and a thumping good one once you get trained up. And Aunt Petunia does what? She says, pages 52 and 53, Vernon says he's not going. Hagrid, I'd like to see a great muggle like you stop him. What? Harry asks a muggle is what we call them magic folk like them. And it's your bad luck. You're growing a family of the biggest muggles I ever lived. Okay? Vernon, we swore when we took him in, we put a stop to that rubbish. Harry, you knew? You knew I'm a, a, a wizard? Okay, they knew, right? Because who? what is Harry's relation to the Dursleys? Nephew. Nephew. How so? Which side? Mother, Petunia is what to Harry? Blood aunt. What is Vernon? In-law, uncle. He's married in. Okay. Petunia was Harry's mother's sister. Right? So, Petunia. No, of course I knew. How could you not be my brat and sister being one? And she just does what? <laughs> She just broke the, dam. broke the dam. I mean, it just all comes out after 10 years. Well, not quite all of it comes out. Because some of it doesn't start coming out until book five. More comes out then, we find out. And in book seven, we find out even more. Okay? She talks about how her sister met Potter, etc., etc. Okay. Hagrid tells Harry about Voldemort. Vernon says, page 56, listen here, boy. I accept there's something strange about you. Probably nothing a good beating wouldn't have cured. Okay, give me one example of something strange about Harry. They cut his hair off and he didn't have to wear clothes. They cut his hair. I mean, they don't quite shave him bald, but they cut it really, really short. And the next day, it's exactly like it was the day before. It just grows back overnight. What else? Scar. His scar, okay. But anybody can have a scar. I can show you all kinds of scars. Go all jaws on you. 
thing with the sweater? How about when Dudley and his gang try to beat him up at school? And he finds himself where? On top of Peck Hall. On top of the gymnasium roof. Oh, and it was windy that day. Yeah, that was it. The wind picked me up. How much did Harry weigh then? We don't to we're not told his exact age, but I would think minimum 60, 70 pounds. Takes a strong wind to lift 60 pounds off the ground and put it on the roof. Generally, that's called a tornado. <laughs> okay? So, Vernon says some bad things about Dumbledore, and Dudley gets a pigtail. So, Hagrid the next day takes Harry off to where to get a school supply? Say it again. Diagonal. Say it fast. Diagonally. Diagonally. Uh. <laughs> Why is it diagonally? Okay, you have to get there a really weird way. We're actually told later on, one of the books, it's off Charing Cross Road. That is, the entrance to Diagon Alley is off Charing Cross Road. It's at a place called the Leaky Cauldron, right? So you have to go to the pub, the Leaky Cauldron, which is on Charing Cross Road. It is between, I think, a bookstore and a music store. Well, every time I do my London course, we walk up Charing Cross Road, and I tell my students, Find a bookstore next to a music store. One, there aren't any. A lot of bookstores, a lot of music stores. None of them right next to each other. Okay? That's one way J.K. Rowling is telling her readers. How many of you started reading this when you were like eight or nine years old? How many of you really wanted on your 11th birthday to get a letter? See, I used to play, I won't call them tricks. But for my kids, all four of them, 11th birthdays, I wrote the letters to them. Didn't have, you know, the Hogwarts crest and all that, but hand wrote green ink on like parchment paper, you know. This is your, and one of my kids actually believed it. Shortly, but, you know, she believed it. So, diagonally, what, she's getting at something there. It's that we can't only look at the world Head on. This is how the Dursleys experience everything. What do we have to do? Does it mean we have to look through our peripheral vision? Nope. It means we have to take a step aside. Because looking at it head on, metaphorically, from this vantage point, means you're looking at stuff how? Whose? Yours. Yours. But if you take one step to the side, you move one degree off. And now I start to see from Rashid's perspective. Now I start to see from Christopher's perspective. Now I start to see from Andrew's perspective. I'm seeing from what? Not my own. It's Tolkien's idea of recovery. Okay? The Dursleys are incapable of doing that. Though, read all seven books, not the damn films, and, and read the seventh book, Dudley does that. Dudley learns to see diagonally in the seventh book. All right? He goes off to Diagon Alley. Why? Get his supplies. What's included there? A wand. A wand? What else? Books, cauldron, finds out, finds out he's rich. Here he's not just well off. He's loaded. So loaded that if the Dursleys knew what he had in his vault of green dots, and they knew how to get it, I, I think it's possible an accident would happen <laughs> to Harry. Okay? What else does he get? What does Hagrid get him? An owl. Okay? Book one begins. Hagrid delivers Harry on a motorcycle. He doesn't have the owl when Hagrid delivers him. Book seven begins. Hagrid takes Harry 
from number four, Permit Drive, and when they arrive at their destination, it doesn't have an owl. It does. Sorry, it's a little hard if you haven't uh, read it or seen it. Okay, so he then goes back home. He takes the journey from platform nine and three quarters, and he gets to school. He meets Ron, okay, he meets the other Weasleys, he meets Ron. And what does Harry think school is going to be like for him? This is going to be terrible. Why? Because he doesn't know anything. He doesn't know anything. Well, how often is it like for like that for somebody who transfers to a new school? They don't know anybody. They have no friends. They have they don't have the same background even. Well, that's what Harry got. Except what problem does Harry have that nobody else has? His title. Title of the first chapter. The boy who lived. What did Ollivander tell Harry when they discovered which wand was his? The brother of Voldemort. Okay. The wand was the brother of Voldemort's wand. What else? What does Ollivander say? We must expect great things from you, Mr. Potter. The owner of the brother wand did great things. Terrible, yes. In other words, don't, don't call me a Nazi. I don't support him, but he did great things. So, he already has the problem of being the boy who lived. And now, he's got the problem of people are going to expect great things from him. So he tries on the sorting hat, and what happens? The hat's like, hmm. Everybody else, they go and put, up the hat, put on the hat, and it's like that, <clears throat> immediately knows where, and he's like, huh, where should I put you? What are the two options? Slytherin and, and Gryffindor. Why not Ravenclaw? Doesn't know anything about magic? Is Ravenclaw only for those who are already knowledgeable about magic? It's for what kind of people? Clev Come on. Is it really just wittiness? High IQ! This is the Brainiac school. We find out later the Sorting Hat wanted to put Hermione into Ravenclaw. And she said no. She wanted Gryffindor. Okay. It wants to put Harry in Slytherin. Why does it put him in Gryffindor? Because he asks. He says no. I want Gryffindor. Why? What does he know about Slytherin? Okay, Malfoy's there. The blonde-haired kid that he met in Madame Malkin's and then again on the train who offered him his friendship, and he said, no, thank you very much. I think I can choose my friends for myself. Who does he choose? The poor kid, pure blood, who also sticks up for him. But Harry sticks up for Ron there, all right? So he chooses Gryffindor. What does the hat say? He says, hmm, not a bad mind. How would you like it if, you know, instead of letter grades, you were like, this was like, University of California at Santa Cruz, and you got written evaluations. And all I put down on your evaluation was not a bad mind. What does that really mean? Is that a ringing endorsement for your intelligence? No, it's not. Okay? It's not like brightest bulb in the box. It's like, you know, between a 40 watt and a 100 watt, 60 to 75, you know, fair to middling. Okay? What else does it say? Talent? Thirst to prove yourself. Now that's interesting. Why does he have a thirst to prove himself? We must expect great things from you, Mr. Potter. And he's the boy who lived. He doesn't know why he lived. It's not like, you know, Voldemort came in to attack him and he went, you know, screamed or whatever. It's just he lived. Okay? So, we will pick up on Friday with, I think, the chapter of the Potions Master. Yeah, we'll definitely finish this. <clears throat>